Okay, I'm going to start my talk this morning on advanced uh, laser, micro laser micro dissection forensic applications. Um, <clears throat> this is basically what we, the work, some of the work we've done on the fluorescent applications of the, of the, um, with the laser micro dissection or the Leica laser micro dissection. There's some really neat ones in here. I, I think it's really, really uh, going to be an untapped, at this point it's an untapped uh, resource for cases and samples where we can enhance the ability to uh, do some of the work and also have some new capabilities. Uh, in the case of laser micro dissection strengths, I think you probably already noticed some of them uh, if, or at least had an idea of what they are, but just kind of go over them again. Microscopic identification of cell increases sensitivity and minimizes handling. One, you look at it under the microscope slide, you can very easily see cells even in a single cell in combination or in a mixture of thousands and thousands of other cells. It's very easy to identify a spermatozoa uh, laying on that slide in, in the presence of many other epithelial cells. Uh, you can also, if you've ever done ex uh, not x-ray crystallography, but uh, drug identification under the microscope or any other type of identification fibers, you're able to pick out individual items by sight under the microscope, which means that you can pick out even small quantities of, of different objects by identification. Your mind is able to do a lot of, with visual identification. Uh, we've seen already it's easy to separate sperm and epithelial DNA, even a physical separation. We feel that quantification can be done through cell counting. We think that's going to be a, a major strength of the LMD instead of having to do uh, quantifier or some other type of quantification method. And with the fluorescence attachment, we're going to see that there are new and enhanced capabilities of the laser micro dissection for forensic use. And the, the fluorescent capabilities, when we look at this, we see the add capabilities for analysis of all types of sexual assault evidence. I'm saying at this point we've looked at the ability to identify spermatozoa and physically separate the, the spermatozoa from the epithelial cells. But what I'm also saying is that now we're going to have some new capabilities where we can look at other types of evidence in sexual assault kits. Things like bite mark breast swabs, fingernail scrapings. Those are items now, yes we can analyze it, but we can't separate the cells from them. The mixture you get is the mixture you or uh, the mixture you have is the mixture you get when you're doing the analysis of it. And we also know that, uh, I think Christine said yesterday, once you get above about a 1 to 20 mixture, you're not really going to see the minor component. However, with the microscope, if you're able to go in there, she showed that you could pick out, even in a 1 to, 1 to 160 mixture, you can still pick out different cells. So now we may be able to do a much better analysis of mixed samples. Again, we're going to improve, the, going back to the fluorescence, what can it do? One, provide improved capabilities of some sperm identification. We're going to look at fluorescent sperm identification here in just a moment. And it's also going to enable new capabilities of of identifying male and female diploid cell mixtures. Right now, that's, you can't do that. If you have fingernail scrapings or a bite mark breast swab, you have epithelial cells or mixed epithelial and blood cells, there's nothing you can do with that. You just simply have to run the analysis. You can't do differential lysis on those cells. <coughs> These procedures are in the development stage. I want you to know they've been done. They've been done on actual evidence, that, but they need to be improved up to the point where they're reproducible and reliable. Many of them are very, or at least the sperm identification is very nearly uh, part of the, in the, in the works, or very nearly ready to be used. The other capabilities can be done, have been done, but there still need to be some improvement to it. So I don't want you to think that uh, these things are ready to go and ready to run, but at least it shows it can be done. It's just like in the days of RFLP, even though I didn't do that. They started with about half a nanogram, or what was it, half a, half a microgram of DNA was what was required to do RFLP in the beginning days. By the time they had improved the development, it was down to maybe 50 nanograms or less. So it was a tenfold improvement over a period of years in that technique. The same thing happened with PCR. You started with the DQ alpha, then you went to the PMDQA1, and now we're up to STRs, mini STRs. And just the science alone, or just the improvement in the PCR, has helped a lot. And I think there's that same track and train 
that can be used on the fluorescents, especially the diploid cell mixtures, that we're going to, it's going to be improved to the point that it's going to be a routine analysis within a year, a couple of years or so. <coughs> One of the problems you have with sperm identification, uh, they're usually pretty easy to identify, except if you have a few spermatozoa. I know uh, you may have spent time looking over slides, minutes or hours. I've heard people say they look at it for hours and so forth. I'm not so sure people still look at the slides for three or four hours, but I certainly think that over a period of time, you might look at one for 30 or 45 minutes and say, can I find a spermatozoa? Uh, one thing about them, if you're searching, and there's a few of them, they, they can often be labor intensive. You can sit in the microscope and look in there with your eyes on the, uh, in the oculars uh, and, and examining it. Now, of course, with the new microscopes, the one we saw yesterday, you can actually look at it on a screen. That should make it a little bit easier. But still, for, for many people, without the the uh, monitor to look at. They're still looking at these uh, slides under with using the oculars. Um, in cases where you have dried samples, where the sperm, there's no tail, sometimes you can be uncertain about the identification. And we talked about this earlier. After you look at, at a slide for 30 or 45 minutes, lots of things start looking like they might be spermatozoa. And I talked about with some of the other people that uh, in our laboratory, if we look at a slide for a long period of time and maybe only find one or two spermatozoa or see something that looks like one, we call in another analyst with a fresh set of eyes to look at it and say, okay, yeah, this is, this is a spermatozoa. You're right. And then they'll, they'll initial the protocol. Um, there are also laboratories that simply look at the slide and base the whole continuation on whether or not they see spermatozoa on the slide. And uh, there are some questions about that, but if you have a situation where you're not able to identify a very few sp spermatozoa, you may actually end the case based upon not being able to find it on that slide. There are a lot of laboratories or laboratories out there that evaluate the, the processing of the case based upon a microscope slide looking for spermatozoa. Another problem in sperm identification where you have excessive quantity of epithelial cells. Uh, in this case, the sp sperm cells can be buried under the epithelial cells. At that point, you basically really can't see them. Um, you can also make this argument, say, okay, large epithelial combined with few spermatozoa, and that presents a problem. These are just different types of problems you see in sperm identification. You also can have low-quality microscopes. If you have a student microscope uh, or a student-grade microscope, you may be, uh, have a difficulty looking for microscopes for spermatozoa. I've, I've looked at some laboratories that had some really low quality microscopes and finding spermatozoa was just about impossible or seemed about impossible under those. You can also have a situation where you have poor staining, make it more difficult to identify the spermatozoa or even see them. One of the ways to overcome some of these problems is sperm labeling by fluorescent dyes. And this is based upon antibodies uh, conjugated to alexafluor. Alexafluor is just a fluorochrome when uh, excited by uh, a UV or, or UVA, will emit typically in the green range, 488 nanometers, I think, something like that. Uh, it's quite a good fluorochrome. Uh, the antibodies are specific to human sperm components. I say that based upon what the manufacturers of this have, t have said. I haven't tried it against different types of spermatozoa or different animal types, but based upon what they've published, or the ones that I have seen published, they are specific to human spermatozoa. Some of them, it's just a, a manufacturer's promotion. Other ones, I have seen uh, published articles where they said it was specific to human spermatozoa. All these techniques are very easy, fast, and one of the things I really like about them is that when you search them, you have very confident in identification as well as not being able to see the spermatozoa. You know, that's the hardest thing to look at in forensic science is negative cases. Not finding something is much harder. If you look at a slide and you find spermatozoa off the right, uh, right off the bat, you're no problem. It's the ones that you have to look at for a long time to say, oh, is this really negative? If I'd have taken another sample, would I have found spermatozoa? I see things in there that look kind of like it. I'm not sure. You know, you're really confident in your negatives. I think the, the fluorescent labeling will make you much more confident in in the negative calls or a fact that you're not going to see a spermatozoa. 
Now, what, is, what are the drawbacks of this? I've put them in red. It does add an extra step in analysis. It will probably make you have to look at the slides the next day. In other words, you examine the slide today, uh, maybe you want to examine five or 10 or 12 different slides. You may want to, uh, when you process them, it may mean you have to process them for a period of time and then examine them the next day. So it's going to add a little bit extra time in your analysis. Oh, I forgot one thing. It's backward compatible. These fluorescent dyes can be used in older slides. However, unless you have one of the microscopes that can pick it up off the glass slides, it's not going to be available for laser micro dissection. So for the Leica microscope, you would have to prepare the slides on a film slide as opposed to taking the existing glass slides or something like that. So it is backward compatible in the fact that you can go back and look at your older slides if you have any question about them, but you may not be able to do laser micro dissection on them. Uh, the other thing is using fluorescence wise requires a high quality microscope with fluorescence capabilities. Now, the laser micro dissection scopes, almost all of them are high quality microscopes. So if you do go the laser micro dissection or laser capture route, those microscopes are, have high quality in there. <laughs> if you go to the marketplace and buy a fluorescent microscope without the LMD capabilities, you should make an effort to get a high quality microscope, which means you're going to be paying in the neighborhood of fifteen to twenty-five thousand dollars to get a microscope with, a fr with fluorescent capabilities and get su uh, of sufficient quality. It doesn't matter what manufacturer you have, they're all going to be right in that same price, but you should make sure that you do get uh, a high quality microscope. If you choose to go the fluorescent scope, without the uh, laser micro dissection or micro dissection capabilities. This is a slide, I did this, uh, uh, oh, well over a year ago. This is a component called sperm paint, and it actually has a, a multi-antibody cocktail. The antibodies are to the equatorial segment, segment uh, SP10 acrosomal protein, and CABR, which is calcium binding tyrosine receptor A. This is actually antibodies to the tail of the sperm. Uh, if you look at the top, or if you look at the procedure, you see it's just strictly put it on your slide, put it in the moisture chamber, and I just like to let it sit in the refrigerator overnight. You don't have to do anything else special to the slide, uh, and then the next day you have to wash it a few times uh, to get the extra excess antibody off of it. Uh, they recommend washing with PBS. The problem with PBS is when it dries, it has crystals all over the place, which it doesn't affect the fluorescent part, but it does affect the bright field part. Uh, wash it with water and then examine it. And look at the top slide. That, that's where you see spermatozoa. There's plenty of spermatozoa up there, but they're very difficult to see. Now, under a microscope, most people would be able to identify them quite easily. But look at the bottom slide. I would believe that anyone, even the people in the back of the room, can see Here's some spermatozoa. All these little bright spots in there are spermatozoa. And you can go back to Brightfield and confirm it. Uh, but I, I find it much easier to look at a dark background looking for little bright spots. You can scan that quite rapidly. In fact, you, most people do their, their searches for sperm at about 40x with a 40x objective. Some people use a little bit smaller, but most people will examine a slide with a 40x objective. With the sperm paint or any of the fluorescent identification methods, you can easily examine these slides with the 20x objective. Cutting the magnification in half means that you can examine four times the area. So examining this slide is going to be much more rapid. You're looking for bright spots in there in a, in a dark background. and it makes it much, much easier to see these spermatozoa at low, at low magnification and with a faster scan. You can always increase the magnification and switch to bright field to examine it to confirm it if you want to. But it's a very, very easy, very, very rapid method of identifying spermatozoa. This particular stain or slide, it was a slight bit overstained. And you see the epithelial cells are bright in there. I didn't have a lot of the component to work with, 
and sperm paint unfortunately now is almost impossible to get however uh, what you would do to simply get rid of those is dilute your antibodies a little bit more and a lot of the background fluorescence with all the epithelial cells would disappear in some ways I think it's kind of nice to have a little bit of it because it does give you an idea of where epithelial cells are but uh, the important thing is that with those spermatozoa as bright as there are they're very very easy to search and another thing you can do with this you can actually see the spermatozoa under cells under epithelial cells or laying on top of them in many instances trying to identify a spermatozoa sitting on top of an epithelial cell is basically impossible in this case you can't are able to uh, identify them yes The, it's my understanding that these antibodies were prepared against their, well, let me go, step back for a minute. Initially, these antibodies were prepared, it's my understanding they were prepared for magnetic bead separation. This was five, six, seven years ago. And they prepared the antibodies to the sperm membrane. And they worked okay on fresh sperm, but what they found out was when sperm dry or re-extracted, they tend to change their exterior or their exposed antigens. So Dr. Hare developed new antibodies to dried spermatozoa through these new exposed antibodies or new exposed antigens. So these should work much better. It's my understanding that these are the ones that are going to work much better on the dried spermatozoa that have been rehydrated and put on the stain. So yes, there is changes to sperm, but apparently these new antibodies are, are designed against sperm that have been dried and have new and different types of an uh, antigens exposed. I think that's also one of the reasons for a cocktail, just to give yes. them more of a chance of lighting up in the mm -hmm. RV. That was actually what he called sperm paint plus. Uh, I think the uh, sperm paint itself only has two antibodies in there. I think it's got the tail and the equatorial plate. Or the, but the uh, sperm paint plus has SP10 with acrosomal cap. That it the two antibody when sperm paint supposedly gives you a better indication or better visual identification. I kind of like to see the whole sperm head as opposed to seeing a circle or a U-shape in there or a horseshoe shape uh, sperm head. It's just uh, what I had looked at. When you said it was hard to get a hold of, is I mean that was sort of our hesitation with that one was it wasn't a commercial product. Where is it in that progress? As far as I know, it's dead in the water. Why? To encourage Dr. Hare, uh, we're still trying to encourage Dr. Hare to um, make these available, um, but uh, I don't know that any more has been produced other than what's already available. He, he, was, he um, originally um, partnered with quite a few forensic labs, I'd say maybe as many as 10 or more, um, to, <coughs> and um, I think they worked well in some hands. Pat's hands and others, I think the um, method was still being refined. It seemed like there was relatively good feedback, though, from his collaborators, but um, it's hard to say what will happen next. I, I, I thought it worked very wonderful. I, I, it was yeah. very easy and very bright. It was just like when you put it on a slide, it's just like that. Did you test it on degraded sperm? I had tested it. Those are actual old samples, old microscope slides are probably maybe a year or two years old that were stored. You know, like Kelly talked about, we, we store all our uh, slides that we make from swabs and stuff like that. So these were already prepared. That was on a prepared glass slide that had uh, our K-mix and other old samples and stuff like that from older samples. So th those were from... They may not represent like a degraded sample you'd see in forensics. Yeah. Some of the samples came off vaginal swabs. Right, but I meant like a purposely degraded, no, you know, I don't, so we don't know for sure how it works with a degraded sample yet. No. Except for if, what, what do you call a rape kit? Is that a degraded sample or do you have to go out and beat them over the head and call them degraded? I'd probably beat them over the head. Okay. Yeah. Well, you know, the, the thing is that if, you, if you're doing some of these older rape kits and stuff like that, those, those are most, a lot of the samples that we are getting. And talking about samples maybe 10, 15 years old, no, we haven't tested against some old ones like that. But if, if, it, if it turns out that there is really a lot of interest in the sperm paints, you know, if you, if you want to 
send me an email expressing that. You know, I might be able to then encourage Dr. Harrow to. I, I mean, I've I've told him that. I mean, Pat said at one of our NIJ meetings that he thought the sperm came through a godsend, and I pass yeah. that on to Dr. Herr. Um So, uh, you know, I'm trying to encourage him to continue with that. Um, but like what we did yesterday, it didn't seem that difficult to identify the sperm on the Leica. I mean, is it? Do we really need the sperm paint with the added cost, and then the risk of it may not stain to a, a sperm that's not in good shape? Or, you know, well, what you used yesterday was not an antibody sperm. Right, I know, but just the visual with the enhancements of the microscope we had yesterday. Mm -hmm. I, think I think that's sufficient. Useful. It would be useful in situations where there's not. Oh, I have a, mic a microphone. <laughs> it would be useful, I think, in situations where you have a very few sperm and you know maybe a lot of epithelial cells or whatever. I think that's where, at least we were thinking. You know, because if you have a large pellet, because you know, we're spotting a fairly large amount, even a small pellet, sometimes, you know, it's kind of hard to really pick out that one or two, you know, sperm. So I think that's kind of what our thinking was. Well, maybe if we do regular, the nuclear fast red, let's say, like we were doing on these slides, we didn't see anything, then could we apply this fluorescent antibody to see if there's truly any sperm there? I think that was sort of the thinking for something like this. Weren't there also issues with um, this sperm paint working on, on the slides that you're using for LMDs? Did you tell me that, Pat? They, they, it works on those. The it sperm works paint those. works on the slides that we currently have. Okay. Any, any of the slides. It's the okay. sperm highlighter that has issues with the oh, pencil. Oh, this, okay. And that's a different manufacturer? Yes. Okay. Well, the, other, when, the other issue, too, is, is that with um, any of these fluorescent products, like you said, Try to, why not use the other stains? Is that there's usually non-specific, and the specificity will help in any kind of software that would clearly go after that one kind of thing that's lighting up. That's going to help software, and we'll see that just later on this morning. The, the sperm paint was was the one that is published to be human specific. The PSA Fitzy is, to my knowledge, not human specific, but it's just an acrosomal uh, lectin. I think that's what. It, that's correct. Yeah. So it may it may actually bind to things other than human spermatozoa. Well, I think that wasn't saying too. We don't know if downstream analysis if it works right. Of course, do we that, know what that that's the only, paint the only either, thing I, I haven't know. tested is it's, it's a protein. I don't think it would have any effect on the DNA analysis, but because I had such a small amount of it, I really haven't had a chance to run it through the DNA, do the extraction and run it through the DNA testing. That's the only part of the. The process that I haven't actually uh, gone through and, and successfully typed it for DNA after, after identifying or cutting the sperm. You can cut it under under fluorescent. You just mark it, circle it, or whatever, and it will cut the, the stain and drop it in the tube. Also, uh, I do not think that the fluorescent dyes will affect the DNA typing because we've also we've done some fluorescent DNA analysis or fluorescent work where the cells were ultimately cut out and then tested for DNA testing. Curious to get to kind of what you guys are thinking here. Are you looking at these fluorescent dyes to give you the specificity, or are you looking at the morphology to give you the specificity? Because it sounds like it's a conflicting opinion between the two. I can see software where that would be very beneficial for software to identify a spermatozoa head, but I think with an individual observing the sperm, they're probably more apt, I would say, from my own experience, to look at the morphology because you're going to have fluorescent background staining. And then the question becomes with, you said, two or three sperm head under cells, what will we do with that anyway? Yeah. You know, there is no well, downstream well, analysis. The sperm, I guess, at least. But. There's no downstream right. analysis that's currently available to do something like three sperm head. Yeah. The, uh, we're going to talk a little bit more this afternoon. But this is not a substitute for the initial step. This is, okay, you've looked at the slide, you don't see spermatozoa, or you see a questionable spermatozoa. You see very few, or, the, or what you see is questioned. You then do this staining to, say, to improve your confidence in the negative or identify more. So this is not something to substitute for the initial search. Because if you look at a slide and see 50 spermatozoa, you cut them out, you're through. You don't need to do this. But in those instances where you only see three, four, or five 
sperm or you have difficulty seeing them, this is a way to do an additional step, examine it, and say, okay, yeah, this is negative, or now I see more spermatozoa. Maybe you have a large field of epithelial cells. And I don't know if Kelly talked about one of the things, but is you can, you can use the laser to zap the nuclei, you know, the, uh, the, the epithelial cell nuclei. So if you, there may be issues where you may be able to go under a cell and, and zap the nucleus and then cut it out. We don't, we don't th this is all areas that we haven't gotten into yet. This, this is novel technology right here. We're, we're just now getting into this area. What are we going to do with it? How, you know, what are our plans here and there to do things? Uh, we, we're, we're thinking about things, so at least, you know, you, in research you have a hypothesis and then you prove or disprove it. That's what we're doing now. Okay, can we do this pack? Right now we're at the stage, okay, we can take the spermatozoa and analyze them. We can cut them off. Can we also, if we don't see it, can we put this sperm paint on top of that and then can we cut those out and do DNA analysis on them? That, that's our next step in this. We, we know now we can see them, but can we cut them out and, and analyze them? And then the next part is, uh, you know, another thing that can be done. Um, and I, I knew in my talk, talk about one thing that we said, oh, maybe we can just do this and get some information from it. It's not a, a separation thing, but there is a way then, okay, well, I did identify positive sperm. Can I do this? And I'll talk about that a little bit, just briefly in my talk. Advantages. It's a simple procedure, and we think it's a method of doing sequential processing. You look, you examine a slide, I see sperm, that's fine. We go, we go on. I don't see sperm, do I feel like maybe I need to do an additional test? This is what it can be used for. Antibodies should not adversely affect the DNA analysis. That's something we have to determine. Even with sperm highlighter, we, we're not certain that these antibodies won't affect. But I, I feel since they're proteins, they really shouldn't have any adverse effect on the DNA typing. Uh, samples can be examined at lower magnification. If you want, you can examine a little bit faster. You've already examined it under bright field. You see nothing or see very little. Now you want to see if there's something else under there. Uh, this is, an imp I believe, feel this is what's called an improved capability. Fast examination and confidence in negatives results uh, can be done on older slides. You can go back and look at a slide. Maybe you want to revisit a case. Maybe there was a case that you did some work on a few years ago that you got a nice sperm profile, but yet you never were able, in the, in the sperm fraction, but you never were able to identify spermatozoa. These are things you can do. Uh, and these, I just want to let you know, the slides I looked at before were from previous slides were from casework like material. These were slides that were taken from, that particular picture was taken from a, a, another slide, another case that had a number of spermatozoa on there. So it's fairly easy to see. It can, as I said, it can be done on older samples. Validation issues for fluorescent sperm identification. Well, uh, analysis is commonly done in the laboratory. Most everyone in here has done sperm identification. So it's not like you're going into a whole brand new novel procedure. It's just the be better method of staining. If you see versus face contrast versus Christmas tree staining, this is just another method of staining. So uh, the process is simple. Fluorescent microscopy component is new. That's the only part that you really have new here. You just have a new way of seeing them, a new way of staining it. Uh, two issues, a new way of looking at sperm. The fluorescent identification does not always give the same morphological appearance as you have under bright field. Kelly talked about having uh, the acrosomal cap and the uh, heavily stained nuclear area. You don't see that as clear with the fluorescent staining. All you see is kind of like a bright blob. It will have some shape to it, but it often has just the appearance of a bright speck under there. You can flip back to, uh, to uh, bright field and confirm it that way. There is a bit of a learning curve. Once you learn to trust the staining, you, you feel a lot more confident with it. I know when I was first looking at them, I would look at every time I saw a bright, I mean a fluorescent dot, I would flip back, raise the magnification and flip back to bright field to yeah, say, yeah, that's it. And they all looked like spermatozoa. I mean, every one I, I changed was a sperm head. It wasn't like, okay, I've got a yeast cell or, or some other product there. Every time I saw one of the little dots, went up to high magnification and bright field and looked at it, it was a sperm head. 
So it's going to take a little learning there, to, okay, to, to trust in this method of analysis because we're not used to looking at just a, a dot out there. Uh, and the confidence and specificity of identification. That's kind of the same thing. It's a new way of looking at sperm. You don't see the, the shape that you see or sh the characteristics in the morphology that you see with bright peel. And it's just developing a confidence in the sp uh, specificity of identification. As I said, they're, they're very distinctive. And you looked at the slide, you had nice bright dots up there. Uh, th sometimes there are very small pin dots or very small pin lights, and you can look at those. And you know right away those aren't sperm, sperm heads. LND component is not required for training. In other words, this is a fluorescent sperm identification. If you do not have the laser micro dissection, you can still use this to help in sperm identification. So in this sense, it's a technology that can be incorporated fairly rapidly. Going through a laser micro dissection or excising or laser capture, yes, you're going to have to look at cutting out uh, more samples or cutting out and optimizing your performance, but this is just a method of identification. This should not take very long to incorporate. Purpose of the procedure, uh, is it laser micro dissection or are you just going to have it for ID only? You know, that's, that's where you have your validation issue. Do, if I'm only going to use it for ID, you can get by much easier for the validation. If you're going to use it for LMD, of course, then you're going to have to use it as an optimized procedure. You have to develop your LMD. But you could develop it sequentially. In other words, get the identification on board and then go with the, and then go with the excising. Um, there's plenty of practice material available. Sexual assault kits are in no shortage in most laboratories. And other validation issues, develop a lab protocol for procedures and use. All samples, confirmation, screening. How do you want to use it? Do you want to use it as a, on all cases? You could theoretically stain every one of them and examine them under, uh, under fluorescence and say, yep, I see it right there. Use your bright field to confirm it if you're not ready to go entirely with sperm. Is it going to be a confirmation of negatives? This is, not a, this is not a test that has to be done on every sample. If you have a sample that's very difficult or you're not so uncertain about the negative result, use this as a confirmation of the negative. It will increase your confidence. I guarantee you, you will feel much better if you don't see these under the microscope. If you haven't seen it in bright field and you don't see it, in fluorescence, I think you'll be much more confident that sperm weren't present. Or is it, ag again, a screening procedure? I I'm kind of against the screening procedure, but there are methods out there now that might be used for auto-searching. Fluorescence would be a good method. You could use a dual stain. And I know sperm highlighter is trying to use a dual stain. Say, okay, if I see blue and green or blue and yellow, then that's a sperm head. I'm going to mark it and it w could enhance auto-searching. Uh, in effects of time after intercourse on staining, that's something that could be examined. Uh, examine slides with defined ratios of sperm to epithelium. In other words, define your sensitivity. If you put, uh, as Christine talked about, the known cell ratios, put one sperm to 50,000, uh, epithelial cells or buccal cells or however you want to do your cell mixtures. So you could examine it that way to see what, what point can I see spermatozoa. Can I find one or ten spermatozoa on the whole slide? If I know there's supposed to be some on there, will I find them? At what point do you feel confident in sperm, that if sperm were present, they would be seen? And again, uh, internal validation, usage, I think it would probably take one to, one to two months to, to really look at how it's used, ID only, LMD component. Um, you'd have to develop your LMD component before you went to this stage. Fortunately, Kelly, I think, has got ours pretty well down, optimized for sperm cutting. So now we know that if we cut these sperm, they should give a DNA profile. If they don't, then there's some component in the staining procedure. But until you know that, you really can't, start doing the LMD on these sperm until you have a, you can, until you can do your laser micro dissection on sperm that are unstained or stained with your nuclear fast red. The next part I'm going to talk about, as, as Christine told you, I'm going to combine my two lectures on, on fluorescence here. 
problems in diploid cell mixture. Simple, a sample may not be identified as a mixture prior to analysis. There's sometimes you may have a stain that comes up or a swab that comes up. Is it a mixed epithelial cell stain or is it a sperm epithelial cell stain? You don't know that all the time. Uh, oftentimes we take bite mark or breast or ch chest swabs or neck swabs assuming that they're epithelial cell mixtures. They may not be. They may actually be a sperm epithelial cell mixture. But if you don't exam examine it microscopically ahead of time, you don't know that. Sorry to interrupt you. You mentioned a highlighter, sperm highlighter. Are you, yes. going, are you going to talk about that in one of your talks? Uh, it's pretty much the same as sperm paint, except for it's a single antibody. To what? Yes. Um, to the sperm head. That's all I know. Yeah, I asked actually manufacturer. The one that came with. Yes, and they said that they do know what's antibody against, but of course they're not going to reveal that. Yes. Um, I wanted to ask you, because obviously you have experience with mm -hmm. both I've systems. I've used from water. Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, what's your opinion? Which one is better in your opinion and why? Sperm paint is much easier. And... I have used it a little bit more than I have sperm highlighter. I just got sperm highlighter less than a month ago. Mm -hmm. Sperm paint I've used several times, and I, I really like the fluorescence. I think it's really bright, and I think the fact that you have published articles, you know where the antibodies are to, what proteins they're to, and the published articles talk about them being human-specific. So that's, that's in the literature. This is not a manufacturer's flyer that tells you it's human-specific. So you have a bu much more information about the sperm paint. It's got a good fluorochrome on it, but they both basically have the Alexa floor. It's Alexa 488, I think, or whatever it is. Right. Both of them, it's a good, good uh, fluorochrome. Uh, very bright, easy to see. Both of them are very bright and easy to see. Uh, sperm paint, again, it's much easier. It's a one-step procedure and then a wash the next day. That's it. Sperm highlighter is about a two-hour procedure. Uh, you start it and you have it's a lot of hands off time but you still it's kind of like you know well, I've only got 30 minutes to go here so you really can't like go do something else like sperm, sperm paint you sit up the end of the day go home at night next morning you're ready to go now you got two hours for sperm highlighter that you need to do and you can, you can process multiple slides at the same time um, but you got a number of steps in there um, that's it Sperm highlighter also has a counter stain with DAPI. That presents a problem with the pen slides. The, da the pen slides have autofluorescence, and they will not work well with DAPI at all. Yeah, we did it on the regular slides because we had a yes. different system that we can pick up cells from a regular slide. So mm -hmm. we did it on that one, and it, it was fairly well. My, uh, my question just actually was, by your own opinion, what would be the higher quality of the picture under the microscope, no matter how much of a, of a work you need to actually put in. It's a pretty much... That, I thought that was a beautiful picture. That was sperm paint. That was an excellent picture. I have a good picture. I don't have it here with me. We, we were talking about sperm highlighter in this, in this workshop, and issues came up, so we just... We were actually going to do sperm highlighter in the workshop, but issues came up, so we just eliminated it from the workshop. Um, so what kind of issues? Just call it issues. <laughs> I, I would be interested to know what kind of issues because we are interested in, in actually yeah. getting one it, of those systems. Let's just say the issues are with a commercial company and their distribution of their product. Can I interrupt? But you can talk to me later about that. Okay. Yeah, off camera. You. Okay. <laughs> so, yeah, I think that would be the best. Good, good, Christine. That's, that would be better because they're, they're just issues. Um, I thought I've got some good pictures of sperm highlighter showing the spermatozoa the, um, in, bright field, in bright field, Alexa floor, green fluorochrome, and DAPI. It tends to do the same thing. The head is more blobby. In other words, it's more of a bright spot with the sperm highlighter. You do see a little more structure with sperm paint at the higher magnifications in the, in the fluorescent staining. Another thing that sperm highlighter does, it eliminates or removes the nuclear fast red. You, you open up the cells and you then uh, remove the 
actually what it, the staining process removes the uh, nuclear fast red from the from the sperm head and then it restains everything so I haven't really looked at that closely does that help or hinder uh, your examination um, the, the, uh, the inclusion of DAPI does help you is, is a point where you can use that to identify epithelial cells as opposed to spermatozoa but sometimes just looking under DAPI alone can be confusing because a lot of things are stained with DAPI that would not be stained with the Alexa floor. And at this point, I think the DAPI is just an extra. It's kind of like, you know, lanyard. Um, so uh, here's, here's kind of a, looking at the slide up there is what happens with the DAPI. That's what you see. A sperm will often look just like that, even though that's a cell nucleus. I don't know if I meant to go to that or not. But. But um, so I, I've had more experience with sperm paint. I really like it. I, I think it's a very, very good stain. I don't think you'd go wrong with it. Sperm highlighter, I've had a little bit less experience with, but the Alexa floor was very, very bright. I didn't have any trouble finding spermatozoa with this. Uh, the DAPI, I know they want to put the DAPI and the Alexa floor in there so they can do automated searches based upon two colors under fluorescence. That, that's a future down the line issue. Um, another problem comes up with the sperm highlighter in that at the uh, last wash is SSC and I think we'll see this when we get in the laboratory that often these crystals on the slide which can be a problem. Um, so th that's what I've seen so far. Um, going back to diploid cell mixtures, uh, mixtures may, may not be apparent when there is a preponderance of DNA from one of the donors. In other words, if you have fingernail scrapings and most of it's from the victim or blood stains under the fingernails and it, there is some male tissue there, you may not be able to tell that. A 1 to 20 mixture, which is about 95 to 5 or 95 percent victim's DNA, uh, you may not be able to detect that there was actually a mixture under there or there was any male components. I know they have the new Y filer now, but wouldn't it be nicer to get a nice genomic profile as a, compared to a YSTR profile if you're going to use uh, statistics. With the diploid cell mixture, you have interpretation issues. I see everyone here will, is quite willing to uh, pull out major minor, uh, but you don't always get major minor. You may get equal amounts. So how would you uh, interpret those? Uh, again, different things, uh, different interpretation issues. Or you may have the minor contributor may be the one you really want to identify. Uh, no current way of actually separating, separating the diploid cell mixtures. In other words, if you have a diploid cell mixture, fingernail scrapings, bite mark, breast swabs where you have the epithelial cells, you just basically extract them and, and get what you get. Because there's no way to enrich one type of cell over the other currently. We look at a, a procedure we started about, oh, about, I guess about close to two years ago, a year and a half ago, maybe two. There is a kit on the market that identifies the X and Y chromosome. Here you have something it's called fluorescent NC2 hybridization. This is where you lose, use a labeled probe to a DNA segment on a chromosome. And what we have is the Vices makes a kit, the CEP kit, that has the probes to the X and Y chromosome. Now what they're used for, or what this kit is used for, is diagnostic and bone marrow transplant where you're trying to identify or determine the recipient's repopulation of the bone marrow. So what they're looking for is if you have a, a different sex bone marrow transplant, which can occur, that was a surprise to me, I said, well, at least they, I thought they'd at least try to match the sexes, but in fact, females can get a male bone marrow donation or vice versa. So what they want to do is examine, is there a way to determine the repopulation or if there is repopulation of the recipient cells in the bone marrow by doing X and Y, XY chromosome or fish. If you have same sex donations you can use identifier. My daughter actually did a uh, science fair project on that but you can take mixtures and, and, and look at the, the different ratios or detect the other one by using identifier or something like that to detect the, the different um, alleles coming in. 
The, the, the kit is designed to stain interphase nuclei. You don't have to use something like colchicine to get your metaphase nuclei, which require living cells. So this will actually work on any cells. So if you can work with interphase nuclei, that's fine. There's no real problem with this. Uh, this is a new capability. At this time, yes? Vices is a CEP kit. I think Abbott Laboratories. It's really expensive, about $1,000 for 10 tests or something like that, or 20 tests. Again, a new capability of analyzing male-female epithelial cell mixtures. I, I think this is really, really fantastic. It, it's really new. Uh, it can be done, but it, it's something that really is, is, I think, really has a lot of future capabilities uh, in the forensic field. Uh, the problems we have with it right now, it does take longer time. It takes about an hour one day and about an hour the second day. It does overnight hybridization. So it takes you about an hour to start it the day before and about an hour to finish it up the next day. It also, at the present time, the fluorescence is more susceptible to bleaching or to loss, loss of signal. Uh, but they do say that you can actually freeze the slides for up to 12 months and retain the fluorescence. Also, the slide, the present kits are made more for using cover slips. Obviously, you can't do laser microdissection in a cover slip. But, you know, it, it's, it's really kind of a neat thing. Um, it's not a very difficult procedure. And here you see the DAPI stain with the, uh, the, the nuclei. And down below that, you see the uh, same nuclei with a fluorescent stain. Here, they're both male nuclei. They have to do it. Yeah. You might. Well, the back. The, back. the floodlights may be. Yeah, you can't see it very well. Can you kill the floodlights? No, it lights up. Yeah. Fortunately, I can still see the screen. Here's your nuclei here. Here's your Y chromosome, the green one. And there's the X chromosome in the red. Can everyone see the, the X chromosome, or the Y chromosome? And there's the X chromosome. So if you had two red ones, you would have a female. Here's your Y chromosome, and right over here is your X chromosome. Those are ideal cells. Those are lymphocytes from a cell culture. They stain very nicely, very easily. Not a very difficult slide. That, that was done by my daughter, 19, the first, she's 19 years old, and she did it the first time. That's her first attempt at it. So the staining does work. It does work on, on pristine cells. So it, it does work there. It is, it's a good capability there, and I know the kit does work. However, when we go to buckle cells from a swab, these were actually extracted from a swab, plated on there, and run. Uh, ahead of time. You can see the Y chromosome quite easily. The X chromosome is a little bit darker. Now, I will also say that that the original picture of this, it was very difficult. This is very difficult to photograph or capture on film. This image for this class has been enhanced with Photoshop to bring out the colors. Often they're much more subtle, especially the red is much more subtle well, subtle is a nice term. Hard to see is a better term uh, than, than the, the Y chromosome. It's fairly easy to get, get that y, the Y chromosome in green uh, as opposed to the two red chromosomes. So now you have a male cell and a female cell right there in the same picture. It would be nice if we could get a little bit better floor, floor, Chrome for the red. I mean, I think that's possible. Uh, and I think also that th this technique can still be, op this st ha still has room for optimization. It does require more user experience. There's no doubt about that. The, the sperm paint, easy piece of cake. I think you can look at it really easily and see it. This one is going to require more uh, user experience. Or 
Are you using the devices filters, uh, fluorescent filters, or, or are you using kind of the standard? I'm filters? using the standard from the... Uh, Would the you expect to see any difference in the... Uh, maybe this is a question for Andy. I know they buy to sell their own filter sets for these dyes. Yes, well, buy to sell their own filter sets for other, other of their kits, or other diagnostic kits for other aspects of, of fish. This here is using standard fluorescent filters. Um, the large part of where Pat's difficulty is, is they're hard to see, they are hard to see, and researchers are using this, and they typically are using different kinds of imaging devices, cooled CCD cameras, which would make this a little easier. But this, um, the fact that this is a, a not a cool TCD camera has, is causing his, most of his problems. In these slides, oh, let me make one comment now. In, in these slides, because this was done a, about a year ago, this was before the new director slides. There's actually, you're supposed to have a counter stain DAPI in there, but when the pen slides and pole and, and pet slides, you can't use the DAPI. So we've had to leave out that counter stain this one was this the one the picture I showed you before was just done on a pen slide, so the dappy came up very nicely. I don't think it was, this may have been done on a glass slide. It's done, but you see the dappy and you see the the nuclei very easily. These because you can't use the cover slip and you can't use the dappy makes it I think makes it a little bit more difficult to identify. So, uh, but you can see it on the other slide on the one where we had the. Uh, uh, both the X and the Y were very easy to see. Uh, they, they were quite bright. There was, there was absolutely no doubt. And these, these are actual cells that you might encounter in a case, or you might encounter these, yeah, they're, they're, they're buckle swabs we've collected from people and put in there, but they're the kind of slides and kind of cells that you <laughs> probably would see in actual case work. Okay. Well, that's sort of to my question was, how intact does the chromosome have to be to be able to stain? Like, where is it stain? You know, like, because most of the cells I think that we'll see that we may want to use this on are not in good condition. Have you looked into, like, where it will, you know, if you have a half a cell? Because I think when you look at a typical, like, skin cell under the microscope from a touch datum or something like that, you can't identify the cell, right. really. So if you don't have nuclei, you're not, you, you don't have intact nuclei, you're probably not going to see this. It's, you, you need to have the whole you need to have a cell, yes. Yeah, I, I don't do think your stain. I don't think your epidermal cells are really susceptible to this type of stain. But you know, things like buccal cells, these are buccal cells, saliva cells, vaginal epithelium, all of those are stainable. All those work. And what's neat about it is that these were dried on a swab, which would be just like what you'd get from a vaginal swab, or just like what you'd get from a buccal swab or some type of swab like you get from under the fingernails. So they're working on dried samples. That was my first concern. Is, is the DNA so degraded after it dried or so broken up after the cell's been dried and put on a cotton swab that it won't work? But all the work has been done on, on samples from dried swabs or have vaginal wash. Like hmm? Have you looked at blood stains? We haven't done it on blood stains. At, at this point, we're, we're looking mostly at sexual assault evidence, but we have not done it on blood stains. Again, we just want uh, our first step is will it work? So. Validation concerns for XY chromosome paint. Uh, somewhere between novel inter internal validation and needs greater time investment. In other words, this, this is not really reliable and reproducible at this stage in the, in the testing. There's a lot of hand manipulation that goes on with this that if you're not careful, will cause problems. There were a number of, and like Kelly was talking, when she first started, she, or she Kelly hadn't talked yet, has she? Um, okay. Well, Kelly's going to tell you that sometimes during her, st her initial work, she would just get a flat line. She would cut cells and run it, and nothing came up. And that's what would happen here. Initially, we ran some of these tests, and nothing came up. Now, the DNA testing I'm going to show you in a few minutes on this was also done before we optimized, completely optimized our procedure. So this is done. The DNA work that was done with this is done before we completed the optimization of the extraction and, and preamp lysis. It's likely not to be a routine procedure. I, I think people will develop expertise in it, but it's not going to be the procedure that you're going to do every day in your laboratory. Uh, I think most of you probably look at prioritizing evidence. If you get a spermatozoa in the vaginal swab and you get a DNA profile from that, you're not going to go much further. 
but it's going to lead to those few cases where maybe you only have fingernail scrapings in a case. Maybe it was an assault or a fight or something like that, and you only have that evidence. This would be the ideal procedure for something like that. So you, you're not going to see this day in and day out in a laboratory. Now, I say that our laboratory is pretty small. If you have something like the uh, laboratory that has 150 DNA analysts in it, you might be running it every day. I, I don't know what the, the qu quantity of cases where it could be useful for. But certainly in sexual assaults, this may be something that's down the line when you have nothing else in your case. This may be on something for a child abuse case where you do not have any semen, but you have genital contact or oral genital contact, something like that. These may be the, this may be the type of case that can be done with that, something where you have no other method of analysis. This is a little bit more intensive. It's going to require a little bit more training, but it's a powerful tool. This is not meant to replace what you're doing now. It's just a new, totally new capability that you heretofore do not have. Uh, procedure development problems. No forensic developed kit. We're having to uh, pirate a commercially developed kit where you have, as I showed you in pristine cells, it worked really nice. In the real world, it's not quite as bright, but it still works. Uh, reproducibility, routineness of it. If y'all if y'all remember when the RFL day RFLP days, uh, you had to do those tests all the time. Once you if you ever laid off for a week or two, you had to kind of relearn everything because they had little subtleties in there. This is the same way. This is it'll take a little bit of time, a little bit of development to get this into routine use. And you will probably have individuals that specialize in this because they're the ones that need to be doing it day in and day out. That's that's the kind of expertise. You need. You can't run this once a year and expect it to work. Even though I showed up there when my daughter did it her very first time, she got success. I mean, that, that was kind of neat and nice and whatever. But in the real forensic world, I think it's going to require, you know, constant usage and constant to work with it. Yes? Are these types of probes available without um, a fluorescent tag? I mean, no? Okay. Probably. I, I, I was just, my question would be feasible in the research world to get unlabeled probes and maybe use better tags like you know that would light up more at the current time I don't it's think these probes are available yeah I just need different lesson tags yeah I don't know that, that that's labeled with Alexa floor that's a that's a good is that the best one that's a good fluorochrome that's really the same know. as we saw in sperm okay. paint it's a quantity of the material they're going after it's, right. it's, it's just small the chromosome's small, and, and, and Vices is renowned for doing prenatal diagnosis and this kind of stuff. So they're going after chromosomes. So it's just, it's tiny, tiny material. And, and all researchers who are using this in prenatal diagnosis are using, again, cool CCD cameras, high-end research cameras that are very, very expensive, and using software to make the colors, okay? It's all done in monochrome and then painted, quote, unquote, not Photoshop, but then the colors added afterwards. And uh, I don't know if you were... Uh, I want to mention the um, Reliagene um, approached me at our NIJ grantees meeting last week mm -hmm. and said that um, they have um, probes that bind to the ALU sequences he on the X and Y chromosome. I talked talk to Dr. Sinha, and he and I have worked together before on, on other research projects. And he's, I told him that, uh, yeah, we'd certainly be willing to look at the ALU sequences. Those are human specific also. These are human specific probes. So. Uh, these cells would be identified as human cells. If we go back to the cell counting, okay, assess the quantity of human DNA. These, these, as well as if you go to sperm paint, that would also assess the quantity of human spermatozoa, which at least ask, ask, answers one of the issues of cell counting. Um, and again, it's applicable to a limited types of samples. Again, this is not something you want to do on every sample. Uh, you may actually at some point if you had a mixed blood stain. I don't know how it would work on that. Right now we're addressing this with sexual assault evidence, which is our primary uh, cases, our primary addressing of this, of this technology. Uh, 
Again, uh, start with LMD. This has very limited usefulness without laser micro dissection. You, you've got to get your optimized cell extraction and amplification procedure down before you go to this route. But that's just as simple as determining what's happening with the epithelial DNA. That's basically all we have to look at. Procedure development and standardization, post-stain analysis. In other words, can you do something after this with DNA? Yes, you can. We've actually already analyzed this. We've done DNA analysis on cells, stain this way. Works nice. You get nice profiles. Chromosome identification. Yeah, that's, that's going to be an issue because this is something people really haven't done before. Everyone's done sperm identification, so that's not a hard thing to teach people how to do. But this is a little bit more difficult. You don't have to sit in a dark room, and you're going to have to learn to look at the slide fairly intently, unless we get brighter fluorochromes or, or more intense by, by numbers. Uh, cell ratios, we've looked at some of this. Uh, I've got some slides on it in just a minute, but that's, that's one thing you'd have to look at. How, how sensitive is it? How, how few can you find? Uh, and it, this, in this case, you're going to have to look at it two ways. You're going to have to say, how few female cells can I find in male cell population, or how few male cells can I find in a female cell population? Fortunately, in sexual assaults, we're almost always looking for the male cells in a female population, which makes it easy because the nice, bright, green Y chromosome is pretty easy. The two red X chromosomes are the hard ones to find. So I think it's going to be much easier to find the male cells in a large female population as opposed to the opposite. Uh, better uh, application evidence sample types. We haven't explored all of them. We've really just looked at what we get in rape kits. The bite mark swabs, the, uh, the fingernail scrapings, those are the ones we think we know it's going to have application to those. But will it work with blood stains? No, we haven't gone that far yet because we're really looking at this as a procedure for sexual assault evidence first and then but I feel that once you get that down, then the next step to the blood stains is, or blood samples or other types of cells is not going to be much of an issue. Day-to-day uh, -day reproducibility, as I said, when we first started it, we did have some problems with flat lines or not working or not preparing the slide properly. There's some little techniques in doing the slide right. But uh, just like what happened with Kelly, everything working out now, we're getting real high recovery uh, of DNA from it. Uh, better probes or better formulation of the probes. That's the thing we need to look at. Uh, more intense analyst training is going to be, this is going to be something that, that, again, people haven't worked with before. So they're going to have to be trained or, or someone have experience in fluorescent in situ hybridization. And low copy number training. There are issues with low copy numbers. Um, we may be dealing with 5, 10, 15 cells in these particular instances. And what happens when you have a profile that's got a lot of dropout? How do you analyze that? Or how do you care about that? What do you do with that? There's always this concern about what happens with YSTRs. If you've got a Y probe, is this going to affect the YSTR testing? No. Here is a while a YSTR result obtained from samples that had already been labeled with the X and Y chromosome. Nice, clean profile. These were cells that were cut out and then examined uh, using the Y filer kit. Extreme cell mixtures. We mixed 99 female to male cells and reversed it. Uh, we were able to go in there and find the male cells even in 1% situation. And this is, this is identified. Uh, we got seven, seven in the initial male profile, low side in the male profile where we obtained results. Uh, as we get to 50-50 mixture, we got a lot closer to 100% uh, results or all the low side. When we went to the female, where the female was in the minority, you see we did not get quite as many loci. But again, this was, this was a, a, a series of tests, and I, I can't remember exactly how many of the minor cells were found in there. But you are able to detect the opposite sex in e even as low as a 1% mixture. Yes? 
how long it took to find that one cell? It wasn't. It was more than one cell, but no. But it, it was not what you would think would be a very short time. This is not a, a rapid analysis. I didn't time it. No. Real case results. We did a number of other steps with it. One, optimizing the procedure as best we could. And then we looked at the use in real case results. I told you yesterday, these are the results you see coming up are cases from actual rape kits collected by sane nurses but, and brought to our laboratory. And then the case was discontinued for some investigative reason. Maybe it was cleared through uh, you know, filing false charges or something like that. But they were all cleared, but they're all actual kits. They were kept at room temperature and, and stored for some period of time. I, I think they were probably, they weren't long. They were probably within two or three months after coming into the laboratory. Uh, identification and dissection of spermatozoa were well established, uh, but we did not, this, in these particular cases, there was no examination or no looking for spermatozoa. We're strictly looking for diploid cells. Uh, the following results based upon diploid cell analysis, again, whether or not there was sperm in these samples, we did not examine them for that. These were specifically looked at for diploid cell mixtures. Forty percent of the cases had at least one sample with enough diploid cells to obtain a male profile. I think we did about five or six cases, and we ended up with about, or maybe close to ten cases, we ended up with about five cases that actually had some results. We got results from vaginal swabs, bite marks, and fingernail scraping. That's interesting. We did get results from vaginal swabs. There were diploid cells in there from the suspect in the vaginal swabs. This, this staining does not work on spermatozoa. So you can't do the fish on spermatozoa. You can't see if it's a male sperm or a female sperm. I know you all all had that question. How many male sperm did you all see in there? Well, about half of them. This is, a, this is the results taken from fingernail scrapings. Here's your uh, 15 loci. We have the known sample from the victim, known sample from the suspect. Here we did the analysis on 30 female cells and 15 male cells on the vaginal scrapings, vaginal swabbings, or scrapings, uh, or fingernail scrapings, I'm sorry. Um, here we got pretty much a limited profile, but in this case, all the, all the loci or all the alleles that were found did come from or were consistent with coming from the, the suspect or, or at least present in the suspect. We also did the vaginal swab and here you see 25 male cells, non-sperm, which were identified and we got a profile from them. We did pick up some other, uh, as you see in the uh, D8 locus, we did pick up a couple extra Alleles, we don't know where they came from at this time, but remember these are real cases. We don't know if there are, is another sperm donor in there, or, and we don't know if that was, those extra ones may have come from the, uh, well, I don't think this was done by a doctor, but um, we don't know where those other ones came from. At this point, um, the eight and the D13 and the, uh, what is it, the 15, 17, in the D8 locus, we're not certain of the of where those came from, but we remember we are dealing with real case samples. There may actually be another male donor in there that we don't know about that may be in very low quantities. Do you have a question? Yeah, I, I wonder, could you tell where what the origin of the the male cells was? I mean, morphologically or anything? Mm -hmm. that I don't I don't have the information, but I, I think it probably I don't think that information was recovered. In other words, I don't, we just saw the nuclei and um, recorded and cut out the cell. My, my suspicion is probably some type of epithelial cell, buccal cell, or, or, or some type of epithelial cell. This would be interesting because this opens up the DNA typing issue for vasectomized males. This is, this is the door right there. Is that because that's all you could find on the slide, or you just stopped when you got to those numbers? The 30, I don't think, was an issue. This is one of the problems with this staining is it doesn't stain 100% of the nuclei. You can't, you can't always look at the nucleus and say, oh, it's a male nucleus or a female. You may only see one of the chromosomes. 
So you wouldn't would not cut that one. So the 30 is probably uh, a number that we stopped at. The 15 is probably all we could find. Because I, I know we normally try to get, in this case, since they're diploid, probably 30 to 50 cells. But you, this is one of the issues is, is you do not have a 100% staining of all the cells in there. Or you may not have a clear-cut indication of all the material. If you see one red chromosome, Okay, is that a male missing the Y or the female missing the other X? So you have to be care you have to be selective on what cells you cut, and that that's one of the issues with this. Is and again, I I want to stress this is quite novel, but this is ac it it does work on actual case evidence, but it it does need more work. Yes. Low copy number parameters for your amping like increase cycles. Yes. Or you thirty months off. I go into the procedure a little more. What was used for these? Because it's what we use for the, the same procedure I use for the low copy or the, for sperm dissection. It's I'm right. That's the yes. same procedure she used. Yeah. Yeah. It was used in 31 cycles. I yeah. think we've always used 31 cycles, except for initially when we tried to get the numbers right. up. I know Jennifer did a couple of things a little bit different, but I think basically uh, that's what it was. And yeah. again, this yeah, and at this point when she was testing these. We hadn't completely optimized the procedure we were going to use with the laser microdissection microscope. I mean, this is all you know, kind of ongoing trial and error, and you know, so that's this is early. This is, but like you said, about a year ago, I think that was. Mm -hmm. And now I've really fully optimized, you know, the parameters of the procedure that we're using. So. What was your what, what's your threshold? We're still using the workhorse 377. <gasps> okay. But here's, here's, here's the proof that it does work on fingernail scrapings. We have the suspect, the known from the suspect, and we can say yes, it's consistent. Certainly that's a very limited profile. I mean, no, one, no one's trying to kid anyone about that fingernail scraping, the male cells, that that's not a limited profile. But perhaps if we'd use the new optimized procedure on there, we may have 100% or 98% of the alleles covered. But again, uh, this was probably done a little bit more than a year ago, probably about a year and a half ago, something like that. So again, the, the procedure, the PCR part of the amplification part was not optimized at that point. Vaginal swab. Remember, again, I keep trying to emphasize, this vaginal swab was not spermatozoa that we identified. These were diploid cells found in the sample. Here's the known from the victim, the uh, known from the suspect. Here's the vaginal swab that was uh, actual evidence. In other words, the, the, uh, the differential part of it gave this type of mixture. We went into the uh, vaginal swab, basically took the cells off of it, the pellet, and we were able to get almost a full profile in there. Now, we did pick up a few extra alleles. Here's the, uh, in uh, what, D21, we had, looked like we had a dropout. And so one, it looks like we might have had some of the victim. We had a dropout and perhaps some of the victim in there. And we had a couple of non-detected and, and a few dropout in there. It's not a perfect profile, but it certainly was one that was consistent with the suspect. Here's a bite mark swab. Uh, when we did the actual analysis on the bite mark swab, you can see in the, let's see, in this column here, the bite mark swab, we got a obvious mixture or somewhat of a mixture in here. When we go to the male cells, we got seven male cells and we're able to get a pretty decent profile in there or, for, or again, a, a limited profile, but again, consistent with the suspect. It's possible that looking at a little bit more or with a better stain, we may be able to get better identification of the nuclei. In all of these cases, what we did, we took the profile, the limited profile of what we had in the sample. Some of those you saw may have only had seven or eight or nine loci, but they were obviously limited profiles. 
We did a local search of our own database in CODIS. The suspect in these samples, even though not prosecuted, was in our local database. And in the instance when we ran it, all those samples received one hit to that suspect. So even as limited as those profiles were, under the conditions of a local search, we were able to search our local, our local database, not the statewide database, not the national database, and find that suspect, match it or hit that suspect in our local database. So yes, these may be limited profiles, but in many instances we're getting profiles that are able to be searched locally in, in a CODIS database and identify individuals. Now obviously ours, our local database only had about 2,000, I think it's what, 2,000 samples that we have suspect and victims in there. But uh, areas that have much larger numbers may have more hits on it. But we were able to identify one suspect from that profile, and it was the one that was associated with the case. In other words, they only had one hit, and it was the one that was associated with the case. And this was the uh, master's thesis work of Jennifer Ballantyne. She has published this and written it, and it is complete uh, at this time. Kelly helped, her, helped with some of the optimization procedures. Uh, the crime Lab, again, helped us by allowing us to do the work. And Jennifer did some of her work at the LSU Health Science Center, where some of the professors there uh, helped her initially with the fish examination. And after she developed her expertise in that, she did most of the work at the crime lab. Any questions? It, it's, 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 it has been published as a thesis. Is it, is it being prepared for JFS or I hope something? so. <laughs> she left our laboratory right after she got her thesis. I guess she got tired and left. So I, I think she walked out the door and it's out of sight, out of mind. I'm, I'm trying to, I certainly have intentions to get it rewritten and, and published. 